Over the years, this tank has received many names. Originally known as the T-28 and T-95, in more modern times it has become known as the Doom Turtle or Zoom Turtle. In today's episode, we take a look at the development of America's only super heavy tank. Throughout history, there have been countless tanks, all designed to kill. But not all have been a success. What happened to the ones that never made it, and why did they fail? My name is Cone of Arc. Join me as we journey through time, uncovering failed projects and forgotten creations in Cursed by Design. With the U.S. entering the Second World War, it was only a matter of time until an invasion of mainland Europe would occur. Today we know this occurred in the form of the Italian and Normandy landings. However, in 1943, D-Day had not yet come to pass, and uncertainty about the German defenses would bring with it the creation of a slow-moving monster. The program began in September of 1943 with a concept to fit the 105mm T5 E1 cannon to a tank with the equivalent of 8 inches of frontal armor. To move this machine, it was originally planned to use the electric drive system from the T1 E1 heavy tank, which was part of the M6 heavy's development. Due to the excellent performance of the 105mm gun, the Chief of Ordnance proposed that 25 of these tanks could be completed in as little as 8-12 to 12 months, and would be able to reduce any fortifications to rubble, clearing the way for Allied forces. This was met with skepticism from Army ground forces, who instead suggested making three pilot tanks with a mechanical transmission instead of the electric one. At the end of a conference between the two groups in March of 1944, a decision was reached to produce five vehicles, giving the tank its first official designation as Heavy Tank T-28. With this decision, the specifications of the tank were also increased, with the armor being increased to 12 inches. In total, it was estimated the tank would weigh in at a staggering 95 tons. Unlike the Super Heavies produced in Germany, this tank would be a low-profile turretless machine with the gun mounted in the hull. Before it was even given to a production facility though, it would receive a new designation. On the 7th of February 1945, the tank was redesignated as 105mm gun motor carriage T95. The reason for this change was the design of the vehicle. Unlike a typical heavy tank, it lacked a turret and had basically no secondary weapons aside from a roof mounted 50 cal and the four crew members personal weapons. This change was approved in March of the same year, and shortly after, in May, the project details were supplied to the Pacific Car and Foundry Company, who had agreed to produce the vehicles. Although I'll note here that in the book Can Openers, it states that the hull castings were manufactured by General Steel Castings Corporation. Unfortunately for the tank, time quickly ran out, and by the time the first hull's welding was completed, the war in Europe was already basically over. With the end of the war in the Pacific following shortly afterwards, the order was reduced to two. Following this, ballistic tests were performed late in 1945. These included 88mm, 90mm, and 105mm projectiles, as well as explosive charges of varying size. Aside from the driver's hood bulge, the armor performed well. To move this increasingly heavy machine, the designers used a very similar power pack as the one found on the M26 Pershing. Interestingly, this means that the Super Heavy tank shared the same engine as the one used for the Super Pershing, which we talked about in a previous episode. Despite this immense power, the weight of the tank caused it to only be capable of a max speed of 8 miles per hour. Even that was not recommended for a sustained period, and in practice it would be used at an even slower 7 miles per hour for any extended travel. The top speed wasn't the only thing that was affected by the weight of the tank. In order to get the ground pressure down, a second set of removable tracks were designed. This would give the tank its iconic look with four tracks, also making it one of the few vehicles to use this style. Even with the tracks attached though, the load on each pair of wheels was a staggering 11,812 pounds, or nearly 6 tons, so this is one tank you definitely wouldn't want driving over your lawn. The removable nature of the outer tracks was a major benefit for the tank though. With them attached, the tank was nearly 15 feet wide, which would have made transporting it quite difficult. By removing them, it would cut the width down to a more manageable size of about 10 feet. In the event it would need to do this during combat missions, the outer tracks could be towed behind the vehicle as a sort of tracked trailer. This process took an inexperienced crew in field conditions around 4 hours, although this was later reduced to 2.5 hours to remove or replace the outer tracks. It was estimated this time could be reduced further if it was attached using self-aligning bolts instead of squared ones. 
This slow moving heavy machine was far different than anything else in the arsenal of democracy and didn't fit any of the existing categories. Due to that, it was eventually decided in June 1946 to once again change the name. This reverted the name back to T-28, however now it would be known as Super Heavy Tank T-28. Following this name change, testing at Aberdeen continued until 1947 without much issue. One of the only major failures came during a firing trial when an issue with the muzzle brake caused it to be blown off landing about 500 feet downrange. Other than that hiccup, the trials proceeded smoothly, albeit slowly. After traveling a total of 541 miles for endurance tests, the end of the project came in October of 1947. Rather than be cancelled for budget reasons, the T-28 had become obsolete due to the successful mounting of its main armament into a fully traversable turret. Although, the story of that design is best saved for another day, as the life of the Super Heavy is not quite over yet. Following its cancellation, they still had a vehicle laying around that weighed more than anything else in the inventory, with the other being lost at some point from an engine fire. The remaining tank would go on to see extended use as a load test vehicle. Most notably, it was used in testing the ability of the US Navy to land 100-ton vehicles onto a beach. This test was performed in Little Creek, Virginia in April of 1948. It would eventually return home, ending up in a field and forgotten about in Fort Belvoir, Virginia, being written off as destroyed. That is, until almost three decades later, when a hunter discovered it almost comically hiding in some bushes. I guess you could say this makes the T-28 a 27-year hide-and-seek champion. It's fitting and a little ironic that one of the slowest tanks in history was developed too slow to see combat. What began as a tank to break German defenses would end as a bush-covered lost treasure. Luckily, being forgotten would be what saved the remaining tank allowing it to survive and be placed on display after being restored at the soon-to-be-opened U.S. Army Armor and Cavalry Collection in Fort Benning, Georgia. If you'd like to see some footage of the restored vehicle, I'll include a link to Sophie Line's video where she shows a full tour of the vehicle. As always, a massive thanks to my YouTube members who voted for this vehicle in the monthly poll. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to give it a like and thank them for picking it in the comments. If you'd like to help support this series, please consider becoming a member yourself, or check out my Teespring shop linked below and get yourself some tank merch. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Appearing now on your screen is a video on another American heavy tank, the Super Pershing, as well as the full Cursed by Design playlist. See you there.